Okay. So again, first thing I'm going to do is uh, pop in uh, just regular old propeller geometry, maybe scooch this over so we can see everything that's going on. And uh, I'm going to rotate this in Y. Now here's a fun little demonstration. Notice how it takes a little while to update propellers because you're, you're actually changing things. Even with faster update, um, there are things that are moving. So what we can do is we can change from blades to disc. And now if I come back here and start toying around with this, it's uh, it's effectively real time because it's not trying to, to loft the blade every time I move it. So we've got this disc mode set up and we'll give it, let's say some Y location and make these each say five foot, why not? Um, set that up to 10, give it some XZ symmetry and while we're at it, let's see if we can do uh, YZ symmetry and move this in X. There we go. So we have four rotors from one component. Not too bad. Let's make this minus five. There we go. So just for fun, that's all put up. If we go back and go to blade mode again, you'll see that we have our rotors. Um, in the interest of time, we can come to the general tab and take a look at some of our tessellation. We've got U and W at 12 and 17 right now. That's not too bad. We probably don't need to run 12 sections for this demo, so we can do something more like, say, 9. And then in the um, More tab is where you have access to all of your clustering. So in this case, our leading edge and trailing edge is already set up for VLM mode. Um, we can leave the root down at 1. Let's say bump that to 0.25 for our tip clustering. And uh, we could give it a little bit more in W, but for the sake of time, let's just let it run. So notice here that we have all of these propellers set up around this central axis where the this is effectively where the component is attached to, and we've moved it over here. But we've got the thrust vector. So the blades are all turning in this direction and the thrust is pointing up so we can tell that as these things rotate around in their normal direction they're going to be trying to lift this uh, fake body off the ground so we can do something like drop a pod in here and we can bring it forward a little bit maybe uh, bring the fineness ratio down make it a little chunky maybe five why not so this is a really big quad rotor, but uh, let's just see what happens here in a minute. Um, and, you know, for no reason whatsoever, let's pop in a, a simple wing just to have a little fun. So we can... Brandon, when you apply symmetry, it will cause the opposite rotor to ro rotate the opposite direction when you do planar symmetry. And so this these will actually rotate the way they should for a quad. If instead you use radial symmetry, say you wanted to do a hex, because the way radial symmetry works, they would all rotate the same way. So you would be better off doing two sets of three or a set of three and applying radial symmetry for three and planar symmetry to get the reflection to six. Yeah, that's a really good point to make. So um, while Rob is, is talking about there, you'll notice that each of these, um, because of the way that OpenVSP interprets the way that they need to turn, you'll see that this one is going to be turning the correct direction. This one's turning back the other way. So they are all symmetric to one another. If, however, we turn this off and turn on, say, Z symmetry, they are all turning right hand. And so as we increase the number here, oh, but I didn't just crash VSP because I tried to, yep, there we go. Um, overkill. Let's try and type in six and uh, make sure I don't hurt myself. Uh, so all of these are turning in the same direction, and that's not exactly what you want. So um, let's go back to none and turn our symmetry back on here. And um, we'll jump into um, VSP Arrow and start playing around with some of these settings. So we'll run VLM and, uh, and let it go ahead and move fast. We only need to do one of these, uh, maybe just a small alpha. 
um, give it some forward velocity and uh, use that to normalize everything. So under the advanced tab, uh, I'm going to give it all of the physical processors that I've got and we'll do 64 wake nodes and some far field distance of say 100 to give the wake some time to kind of bend and, and do things. And we'll turn rotating blades on. So for V infinity, if we're talking about a Mach number of 0.01, um, let's set this to something like, mm, say, 30. And then for V ref, because we're going to spin these a little bit faster, we can set it to something like, say, 450 and 0.4. These numbers aren't going to be exactly right because I'm just kind of eyeballing it. Um, and then here, our RPM, you can see uniform RPM is turned on. Let's just back that to, say, 860. It's kind of a similar value to what was done in the demonstration earlier, and you'll see that all of the RPMs have, have updated. Now, uh, we don't necessarily need to go to five revolutions this time. We can back it off to, say, four. And let's do... Let's show what happens when we start from steady state. And so... Yeah, it's only 3.30, so we have some time to let this thing kind of chew through, and um, we'll show what happens. So let's go ahead, and I almost broke my own rule, save often. Um, I'm going to jump up and save this as a VSPRO demo. Save this as quad. Um, because if VSP crashes, I won't be able to get any of that back. So now we can always start where we left off. And, uh, okay, so let's launch the solver and see how it goes. All right, so it's chewing through. You can see that it's taking a little bit of time, and it's going through the time step one five times uh, so that it does the steady state. So it's initializing everything before it starts stepping through in time. You can see that now our time steps are advancing, and everything is uh, converging and reducing the order of magnitude in about the same amount of time. So hopefully nothing is too wild in the solution right now. If we start seeing these grow and grow and grow, it means that the wakes tangled themselves up and uh, we probably didn't get a good solution, but but that's okay too. Uh, let's see here. Um, I see there's a... No, we, everybody's been uh, answering here in the conferences IO, which is good. So it doesn't look like anything is currently unanswered uh, we're doing all right and so you know again this is you know uh, an unsteady case these are moving bodies um i remember there was a uh, a question in the live chat about going over some of the the dynamic case setups and as soon as this is done running we can kind of open that up and take a look and and dive a little bit into um the say the text files for a dynamic run I don't necessarily want to bore, bore everybody to tears while I'm doing that anyway, so I don't think it will hurt anything for me to go and uh, dig into that while we're doing this. Let's see here. That's there. So while that's kind of running in the background, we'll take a look at these files. Um, let me move this out of the way so I can make sure everything's still working well. Um, so here's what we're looking at as part of the the dynamic files so we've got the vsp arrow file is the input to the run itself the groups file is what designates everything as either a fixed or a dynamic component or a rotor and then you've got the group file you've got the rotor file so there's rotor one rotor two and then excuse me there's a group two file so in each of these 
if we pull them up and look at them, we've got, come on, here we go. So this is what the VSPRO input file looks like for this, which is pretty much the same as you would see for any other run, except for when you get down here and it starts talking about time steps. So when you say time step is minus one, that's telling it use auto time stepping. And then when you have minus four, it's saying use four rotations of the unsteady, unsteady rotor. You can set those to be positive values, say time step of 0 0.005 or one times 10 to the minus fourth, you know, whatever you need, and then give it a certain number of time steps. And that works as well. And then down here at the bottom, you can see that the number of unsteady groups is five. Four of those are propellers. So the fixed part is the pod and the wing, and then the unsteady propellers are the four individual bodies on the outside. So if we take a look at the groups file, not to be confused with a group file, groups with an S, this is where it defines what each one of these components are. So you'll see that in the fixed group, we've got three components. This includes both the left and right side of the wing and the pod. So we identify those components here and it says that the geometry is fixed. You can specify, you know, the orientation, but because it's fixed, all of this can be zero. That's not a problem. And then below you have each of the propeller components. So it identifies how many, what it belongs to, is it a rotor? And then it gets things like the diameter, the origin, so where it's located in space, what rotation vector is attached to that, and the, uh, the omega or the radial velocity. And so each of these are automatically generated from the GUI, but if you need to go in and change them manually, you're welcome to. And so here we see that our runs complete. So, you know, we're back to load distribution, but if we look at blades, we can pick one. And again, here's a, you know, the, the load distribution on that blade. And here are the unsteady results. So for the thrust, it's got all four of the rotors. Each of them are up here kind of hanging around 80, 90 pounds. But what you should notice here, especially with the time history, is that because I didn't really do my homework and make sure that all of these were posed very well, over time, we start to get noise in this. So you can see how these are starting to shake and, and cause a little bit of disruption out here. If we ran this even further, we'd probably see these start to grow. And uh, what you see going on there is that one, the mesh or the, the grid is kind of poorly refined, which we already knew. And two, that the time stepping and the RPM and the size and everything that I gave it is probably a bit unrealistic. So let's go ahead and take a look at the viewer and see how this solution looks. So I'll maximize this and zoom in a bit. And let's show our pressures and our trailing wakes. And we'll go ahead and use our contour legend. So right now there is no information. We haven't stepped through anything, so it's all zero. And then in the first step, that is the result of our steady state start. So everything runs as if it's a regular VLM mode. It attaches wakes to everything and initializes. So now our contour is set up accordingly. And then as we start to step through, you can see again, as Rob mentioned, these are turning the way that are that's intended. This one is turning this way. And because we've got symmetry turned on, the RPM is the same for every one of these, but they are turning the correct direction in space, which is pretty awesome. And so as we step through, you can see that that initialized wake starts deflecting, it starts deforming. This wake out here at the wingtip is getting sucked into this propeller back here, same story back here. And all of this stuff is kind of interacting with each other. And so we're, we're kind of clipping through. And, you know, we only ran this for four. So, you know, keep that in mind as we're blasting through these solutions. And uh, we only had an angle of attack of four degrees, but we're, we're only going really about 30 feet per second, at least according to our, our input. We're not going very fast. So the wakes, you can see, are kind of pushing down, but they're starting to, to flip and interact. These are starting to impinge on the ones back here. And we've given it enough time to where everything in the model is starting to interact, which is where some of that noise is coming from. But in the interest of say how long time has advanced in the model itself 
you know, we only gave it, say, 100 in the far distance, you can see that the wing wakes are kind of fading out into nothing right about here. Uh, if this were going quite a bit faster, if we gave it a far distance of maybe like 500, we would probably see these wing wakes a bit farther out. But what we did, um, we started everything out as if it was moving in and fine with that initial steady state solution. And when we turned on time stepping, we only let it advance a very small amount of time because now we're on a rotor time scale. And some people will occasionally ask, you know, can we do things like control surface response for unsteady rotor analysis, or can we do a transition run, things like that. Like, yes, technically, um, but you're talking about two completely different time scales. You're talking about, you know, 10 thousandths of a second or even smaller, depending on the size of your rotor and your RPM versus, you know, a few seconds to even 30 seconds of trying to tilt a wing. So, the time scales are just hugely different and that in part is is where that quasi unsteady stuff that dave was talking about can be really really handy so um so keep that stuff in mind as well um let's see so i'm trying to remember was there anything else that i was going to uh demonstrate here quickly rob or uh, was that the one that we meant to go back and hit i i think that's great um there was some question earlier today about arbitrary motion, um, either. Oh, uh, right. But uh, I think that's probably pretty complex to set up right now. Maybe, maybe you should, uh, you know, work on something offline and have it canned so you can do a quick demo uh, later in the workshop. Yeah, that one. Uh, there are a couple of things that we can demonstrate uh, for, you know, say. Uh, fully dynamic solutions which get kind of interesting um but ones that are typically applicable for say tool validation cases would be like periodic motion that is uh is reasonably excuse me reasonably easy to set up and um so if we don't get to it with some extra time maybe tomorrow we can tack that on uh on say thursday afternoon <laughs>